Thank you for joining for the HPL seminar today. Today, we'll be hearing from Siska Boisuit. Siska is currently a postdoc advised by Dr. Walter Erzog. She is funded through a fellowship she received from the Swiss National Science Foundation and receiving this early postdoc fellowship is one of her proudest accomplishments. Prior to joining the group at Calgary, Siska completed her bachelor's and master's in the physical education and movement science program at Ghent University in Belgium. She did an additional master's in the UK at Liverpool John Moores University studying sport and clinical biomechanics. Siska completed her PhD in health sciences at the University of Luzern and Swiss paraplegic research in 2019. Her PhD project focused on the effect of fatiguing wheelchair propulsion on risk factors for shoulder pain. Siska's research focus is on risk factors and preventative measures of non-traumatic musculoskeletal injuries. She is especially interested in understanding the development of soft tissue injuries by studying failure properties and the functional capacity of muscles and tendons. And she hopes to apply this knowledge to pre improve injury prevention programs. As a fun fact, Siska is a para coach for the Calgary Rowing Club and she herself is a rower. As a reminder, I will first turn it over to Siska for her presentation and then we will have a question and answer period to follow. I will remind everyone at that time how to submit a question. With that, Siska, you're welcome to start sharing your screen whenever you're ready. Thank you, Emily, for a nice introduction. It's a great pleasure for me to present here today about the work I uh, have been doing during my postdoc um, here in Calgary over the last 15 months. Um, I would like to... Can you all see my screen? Yes? Yes. Okay. So, um, yes, yeah, so what I've been doing over the last 15 months with my... Um, supervised by Professor Dr. Walter Herzog. And I came to Calgary to better understand how muscles and tendons interact. And this question originated from work I had been doing during my uh, PhD in Switzerland, where I was looking at shoulder tendons of wheelchair users, especially because uh, these tendons are a common site of chronic tendon degeneration or tendinopathy. Now, wheelchair users are um, not the only population where there is a high prevalence of tendinopathy. Also, the general population presents a high prevalence with, for example, uh, here an example of basketball athletes. And tendinopathy can lead to pain, impaired load-bearing capacity, and at the final stage, stage tendon rupture. It's a common problem that has a detrimental impact on quality of life, work productivity, and socioeconomics. But unfortunately, um, treatment strategies remain unsatisfying, as despite treatment, for example, two thirds of the persons with new onset Achilles tendinopathy still present um, symptoms after one year follow up. Now we know that tendons transfers, transfer forces from muscles to bones, and a healthy tendon is characterized by these, by these nicely organized collagen fibers which we can see on an ultrasound image here, we can see a bicep standing in between these bright white lines where we can see the nice and distinct black and white lines representing the collagen fibers. But with overloading, this can lead to micro damage of these fibers and furthermore um, result in tendinopathy. So tendinopathy is characterized by these disorganized fibers, increased cellular activity, more rounder cells, there's capillary ingrowth, and the tendon um, may be thicker, as for example, in this ultrasound image where we can see a biceps tendon of a wheelchair rugby athlete. Now, research has shown that tendons that have a more energy storing function, as for example, the Achilles tendon by the um, storage and release of energy are more prone to injury, as these tendons present differences, or they do present differences from 
um, tendons that have a more positional function, as for example, the tibialis anterior. So these so-called energy storing tendons were found to be more extensible. They um, were found to be less stiff and more fatigue resistant. And furthermore, it was found that these tendons have uh, or present more fascicle rotation, suggesting that there may be a helixal component that uh, helps the um, efficient uh, stretching and recoiling of the tendon. So here we can see an image um, of um, a tendon where you would see this uh, helical, helical component. But if we want to fully understand the functional capacity and the failure properties, we need to understand how forces during everyday life impact the variable tendon strain. And if we look at this interaction, we can see um, that we have a loading and unloading curve where we then also have, for example, the energy loss, which is the area in between the loading and the unloading curve, and which uh, refers to hysteresis, which is an important factor in the efficiency of movements. We can also look at stiffness, for example, which would be the slope of uh, the loading curve. Um, now, while we um, uh, are looking at this, we, uh, it's important that we know that these forces come from our muscle, obviously. And as was shown in the model of Hill in, from 1938, which is a classical common use model, the, um, the muscle, which would be the contractile element, the force producing element, is in series with the um, series elastic element. So this implies that um, the elastic element and the contractile element endure the exact same forces. And that we can, for example, look at muscle forces while measuring it in the tendon. Now, while um, Hill was mentioning that this elastic component could include uh, or included the tendon, He's also referring to additional structures that could be included in the series elastic component. And so it was then in 1980s that for the first time there was experimental evidence from uh, the group of Hoffer et al. that showed uh, or specifically investigated muscle forces in line with uh, length changes of the entire muscle tendon unit and the muscle fascicle themselves. And what's important to take from this graph here is that they found that during the stance phase with increase in muscle forces, while there was lengthening of the entire muscle tendon unit, the muscle fascicles shortened. And so it was um, suggested that um, this would go in line with stretching and recalling of the tendon and thereby allowing minimal changes of the muscle at this moment and um, so that the muscle can operate at certain lengths. Now, um, this was confirmed by uh, literature um, by several other studies and in several labs following this study, um, but there has also been a lot of controversy in this field, more specifically in terms of the, when we look at the aponeurosis, the tendon and the muscle. So the aponeurosis very simply said is the connection between the tendon and the muscle. And uh, while the tendon is exterior to the muscle, um, the aponeurosis is actually a sheet on the muscle and the muscle fibers insert into the aponeurosis, which also consists of a tendinous tissue. And so it has been assumed by several studies that the aponeurosis is mechanically in series with the tendon and therefore assuming that the aponeurosis endures the same forces as the tendon. Now, there are several reasons why we um, can state that this would not be the case, as it's important to, to consider as well that the aponeurosis obviously undergoes also the changes, the shape changes from the muscle as the muscle is contracting. Now, while musculoskeletal modeling and simulation studies offer an opportunity to really investigate how loading impacts our musculoskeletal system and also to predict the effect of intervention studies, these go in hand with many assumptions and that are often based on results from in vitro studies. For example, if we look at hysteresis and energy dissipation, we see that uh, studies that have reported 
or that have conducted in vitro experiments, the black squares generally report much lower values of hysteresis as compared to results from these in vivo studies. And in fact, um, or while these in vivo studies have uh, looked at tendon strain through the use of ultrasound, which um, goes in line with um, uh, limitations, but then the in vitro studies take the tendon out of its natural environment and ignore the muscle tendon interaction. And in fact, no study to date has actually directly measured tendon strain and muscle forces during dynamic movements in vivo. So why is there a lack of such in vivo experimental data? Well, as we know, it um, goes in line with complex technologies um, that would allow for such measurements, which then also imply an invasive approach um, and that would require the use of animal models and which then also goes in hand with a lot of time and costs related to it. But so this is exactly what we wanted to do for my postdoc. And this was to um, investigate how muscles and tendons interact during dynamic movements in vivo in an animal model. And so we hypothesized first that minimal length changes in muscle fascicles during the stance phase, as what was found previously, would coincide with lengthening and recoiling of the tendon, as no one has actually directly measured tendon length changes together with um, muscle fascicle length changes and muscle forces. We then also hypothesized that the aponeurosis elongations would not be related or instantaneously proportional to the muscle tendon force and demonstrate that the tendon and aponeurosis are not mechanically in series. Secondly, we wanted to then investigate um, or to compare in vivo data with in vitro experiments when we replicate the in vivo conditions and then we are looking at the exact same tendon. And here we then hypothesize based on the literature that tendon hysteresis in vivo would be larger as compared to in vitro. So um, to answer our question, we want to um, look at a sheep model because sheep are easy to handle. They have an appropriate size for the technologies that we wanted to use. And they also have a nice example of such so-called energy storing tendon. So we are interested in the medial gastrocnemius, which also has a nice and unipennate muscle um, to, uh, which allows easy investigations. And so we trained six sheep to walk on the treadmill at different speeds and inclination angles, after which we then had the surgery where we implanted several sensors. So here we can see a picture from uh, the implantation on the right hand side and on the left hand side we see a drawing that relates to this. So first we have this force buckle E-shaped force buckle transducer. Um, which has two strain gauges and that allow to measure changes in voltage as the muscle is producing force and the tendon is being stretched. And this we can then calibrate to change in forces. We also have a, um, the wireless passive electronic strain sensor, which is this part here connected to a readout coil, as well as sonomicrometry crystals to measure tendon strain. So the crystals have been commonly used in muscle and they consist of piezoelectric material and communicate with each other with the use of sound waves. And because we know the speed of sound and the time it took to go from one to the other, because they're actually two crystals, um, we can measure the ex exact length changes. So a little bit more about this wireless passive electronic strain sensor. This was developed at the ETH in Zurich at the Laboratory for Movement Biomechanics. And this sensor consists of an inductor resistor capacitor circuit, um, which is fatigue resistant and can work at high temporal resolution of 1000 Hertz and uh, has a good spatial resolution. So the capacitor is this brown part here. I hope you can see my mouse, um, which is attached to the tendon. And as the capacitor is being stretched, we can then calibrate the change in resonant frequency to a change in strain. We also will have uh, four crystals, uh, sorry, yeah, four crystals in the muscle and two in the tendon. So here we can see an image of the medial gastrocnemius tendon of uh, the sheep. As you can see, it's unipennate, which means that there is a uniform direction of the fascicles um, in relation to the longitudinal axis. And so um, I draw, drew here the tendon, which then connects 
to the distal aponeurosis, and on the other side, we have the proximal aponeurosis. So crystal one and two allow us to then look at the length changes of the proximal muscle fascicle. Then we have also another fascicle more distally. So the crystal three and four allow to look at the distal muscle fascicle. And then we also have information about length changes of the distal aponeurosis as well as the proximal aponeurosis. So following uh, the surgery and sufficient days of recover, which lasted between two to three days until the sheep is walking comfortably without any signs of limping, we have done our in vivo experiments. For that, we then have the sheep uh, back on the treadmill. And um, because only one of our sensors was wireless, um, the other sensor, the wired sensors, the wires are tunneled underneath the skin and connected to this backpack connector, which you can see on the left-hand side. This is then connected to our computers where we record all the data. Once we are um, glad with our data or once we have everything we wanted, we then have the sacrifice of the animal after which we calibrate uh, the force buckle and we then isolate the muscle tendon unit, which we then take into our lab to test uh, within 24 hours. So for the in vitro experiments, we clamp our a tendon with part of the calcaneus um, on the distal end and the proximal end is then clamped on the tendon itself. And here you can see that the force buckle is still connected to the tendon. We um, keep our tendon moist by spraying a saline solution every two minutes. And we then first have a warm up of 101 cycles, 1% strain, which is followed by different conditions every time 51 cycles, where we try to replicate the in vivo conditions by applying the same strain rates and trying to achieve the same forces that we had seen in vivo. So um, now to our results, I want to disclose that um, as we are still collecting data, we have only completed data from four sheep. We still have two more to go, and so we're still analyzing the data. These are pre preliminary results, uh, but I will show you results of this one sheep here. Um, so yes, first uh, I'll show you some results of the muscle forces that we retrieved from the buccal transducer. So on the y-axis, we can see the, or we will see the muscle forces in newtons. On the x-axis, uh, we have the gait cycle as a percentage, so 201 time points. And then the, um, which starts at a hoof strike. So this is the stance phase. Then we have the vertical line that represents the end of the stance phase, so toe off. And then we have the swing phase. So when we look at the forces from this uh, low, slowest condition, so the blue, walking trial, we see increase in forces going down uh, and then small, almost no forces during the swing phase. And so as we increase in speed, we have indeed an increase in our muscle forces. So um, what you can see as well is that the blue and the orange lines represent walking, while gray and yellow represent trotting. Um, and so we can see a shift or a change in the forces, which is in line with what, what we would expect as also the kinematics would be changing when changing um, from walking to trotting. When we then compare this to the EMG, we can indeed see that uh, as we go up in speed, the muscular activation increases. And when again, when we have the trotting trials, the shift goes a bit more uh, to the right, which is in line with the shift of the forces as well. Now let's have a look at the muscle fascicle length changes. I'm showing, or I will show you here only the changes in the proximal fascicle. Um, and what we see was in line with our hypothesis. So here we see the slowest walking condition that there are minimal length changes in the beginning of stance phase, but then greater length changes in the swing phase. So allowing the muscle um, to um, work at uh, with less length changes during the stance phase and then this was consistent over the different uh, velocities. So now obviously we are interested to see what's happening in the tendon because we would expect that while we here see minimal changes in the muscle, we would see greater changes in the tendon. So um, I want to say that we have been having um, difficulties to 
obtain good tendon data. First of all, we at this moment, we have not been able to, to have data from the wireless sensor yet. Uh, we had to change our approach. So we had first the crystals in the tendon, um, which we then changed to having uh, the crystals outside of the tendon and connected to the outside of the wireless strain sensor. And so I will show you now results of uh, when we had the crystals on the outside of the strain sensor. And I will show you two steps at two different speeds. So here we can see the force profiles of those two steps. So orange here is walking at a slow speed and yellow is a faster trotting. When we then look at tendon strain as a percentage, so a calculated percentage as a change in tendon length relative to zero strain, which we obtained from our in vitro experiments. And when we then look at tendon strain, we can see that with uh, increases in forces, we have a lengthening of the tendon, and then we have the so-called recoil as the forces go down, which however continues longer and will then start to rise prior to seeing great rises in muscle forces in the swing phase. When we look at uh, a higher speed, we see um, that the profile is fairly similar to the slower speed. And this makes sense as because of the viscoelastic material of the tendon as with an increase in speed, we have an increase in strain rate. So we would expect an increase in force, but not uh, a great change in the tendon strain. If we then uh, look at uh, tendon ver strain versus uh, muscle forces, so we wanna look at the hysteresis, we get the following plot. Um, and um, what uh, we see is that indeed with increase in force, we have an increase in strain. Uh, the, the curve doesn't necessarily explicitly reflect the um, typical curve that I showed you in the beginning, su suggesting that there may be a more complex interplay between the tendon and the muscle, which could be related to this um, rotation of the tendon fascicle as has been investigated um, of, with the group of uh, Dr. Hazelstreet at the University of London. Um, but we do see this um, toe region that we would expect that could then relate to a more linear, uh, that then turns into a more linear relationship between strain and force. Now we do need more data to um, actually calculate hysteresis and uh, further uh, investigate uh, this association. If we then look at the muscle forces and the aponeurosis length changes, uh, we can see that um, uh, here for the slowest condition, the, there is minimal length changes in the aponeurosis in the beginning, it's slightly shortening, and then there's lengthening during the swing phase. And this is consistent over the different velocities. And so this clearly shows that the aponeurosis is not showing a similar pattern as the tendon or the aponeurosis does not lengthen in proportion really with the changes of the muscle forces, thereby supporting that um, these two, that the aponeurosis and uh, the tendon cannot be mechanically in series. In fact, when we plot the length changes to the forces, uh, we see um, a counterclockwise loop. And this is part of the thesis of Sarah Abramovich who will be defending next Monday. So with this counterclockwise loop, this would imply that the, that the passive structure like the aponeurosis is, um, is producing um, energy, which is in fact not possible. Now this has important implications for the literature as um, there has been, have been conclusions on properties of the aponeurosis where they have made the assumption that the aponeurosis undergoes the same forces as the tendon. For example, uh, there is a study of Zurbier from 1994, as well as from Lieber in 2000, where they look at the surge and release of energy and where they show or they, they conclude that with um, that the mechanical properties of the aponeurosis change with the contraction of the muscle. But they assume that the forces of the aponeurosis are the same as the forces of the tendon and thereby um, it is highly unlikely that a passive structure would change its mechanical properties. So it's much more likely that actually the forces 
along the up and roses are changing, causing changes in strain with muscle contraction. And so also the study of Magnussen of 2001, which is highly cited, has made this assumption and has made conclusions of uh, up and roses, a stiffness and, um, and the elastic modulus of the up and roses where they are then actually overestimating the forces in the up and roses. Now, if we then look to our in vitro results, uh, we're going again um, to compare muscle forces to tendon strain. We see that when we replicate different uh, velocities, so these are the two slow walking conditions, we get hysteresis values of on average 14, 13%. And here we see the more um, textbook type uh, typical hysteresis curve. And this is not surprising that this would differ from our in vivo results as we indeed take the tendon out of its natural environment and we ignore the muscle tendon interaction. Interestingly, we do see that the strains that we um, that are applied to um, retrieve the same forces when we're applying the same strain rates are higher, about two to two and a half percent as compared to what we saw in vivo, which was about less than 1%. Now it's important to note that to calculate our percentage strain in vivo, we are using the reference length from our in vitro experiments um, because at this we are not uh, because to the best of our knowledge, this is the best way how we what we could use as a reference length. Um, so in when going back to the aims and the hypotheses, we investigated or we aim to investigate how muscles and tendons interact during dynamic movements in vivo in an animal model, and we hypothesized that the minimal length changes in muscle fascicle during stance phase would coincide with lengthening and recoiling of the tendon. And this was indeed confirmed. Although we did see that there will be maybe a more complex interaction between muscle and tendon because of, of the rotation of the tendon fascicles. So um, this warrants to be um, further investigated and um, we have to be very conscious about this uh, for future studies. Furthermore, uh, we hypothesized that the aponeurosis elongations would not be proportional, instantaneously proportional to the muscle forces, and thereby show that the tendon and aponeurosis are not mechanically in series, which was indeed supported by the results, and which has significant implications on those um, previous conclusions that have been made. And uh, secondly, we aimed to compare in vivo data with in vitro experiments, because we don't have um, enough tendon strain data at the moment yet, we still need uh, more work to be done to uh, further explore this, but we did see um, differences in hysteresis curves in vivo versus in vitro, thereby again, uh, stressing the importance of being cautious when making assumptions from in vitro experiments. So in conclusion, we, uh, with this research, we um, hope to um, improve our understanding of this complex interplay between muscles and tendons during dynamic movements in vivo, which provides a foundation for future studies assessing and monitoring soft tissue healing and improving stepwise load progression in rehabilitation. And so I want to acknowledge uh, the host institute um, as you can imagine, there's many people involved in such project, as well as the group at the ETH uh, for a collaboration with regards to the strain sensor, and then also the funding agencies. And thank you all for coming and I'd be happy to open the discussion. Thank you, Siska. That was a great presentation. And at this time, I'd like to kindly ask the audience members to turn on their Zoom camera if they're comfortable to allow for a better discussion. To ask your question, you can use the raise hand function by clicking on reactions on the bottom of your Zoom screen. And if you're unable to raise your hand, please feel free to type your question in the chat box and I will read it aloud. So, so Siska, maybe I'll start with a question. Can you clarify, were you expecting 
the aponeurosis to lengthen or shorten with increasing muscle forces? Thanks for, for that question. Um, so it's a, it's a good question. So the in our interest is to see if they are in series. Um, as the muscle is contracting, there is um, also strain. Um, so the muscle is changing its shape and there's also transversal strain. So I would expect changes in both the length as the width of the aponeurosis. Um, but this could, if this, I would expect this to change um, as the muscle is contracting because the muscle itself is changing its shape. So I did not have um, specific hypothesis on how the aponeurosis would behave, but it was more an interest of, is it behaving explicitly in series with the tendon? Okay, great. Um, Benel, please ask your question. Yeah, thank you very much, Francesca, for an excellent presentation. I enjoyed it. Uh, first comment, and then two questions. What is the dynamic movement? Is that contrary to a static movement, or what? With the yeah, with the dynamic movement, I was referring to, um, for example, oh, walking. It's just a you, have... you say twice the same movement is dynamic. Yes, you're right. Thank you. That's a minor comment. You have these sensors in position one, two, and three, and four, where you made some conclusions from. How did you make sure that these sensors one and two were aligned with muscle fascicles and three and four were aligned? That's the first question. And the second question, these sensors that were developed by Kuyang Tang, how do they work? Okay, thank you. So thank you for those questions. For the first question, um, so we place the sonomicrometry crystals. We use a micro stimulation. So we place the first crystal at um, one side of the muscle, and then we try to do, uh, we stimulate this fascicle, and then we would see dimpling at the other side of the muscle where the fascicle ends. However, we have to say that this was not always possible, especially for the proximal fascicle because it was so deep and we're working in a, almost a tunnel or the surgeon was working in, a, in this tunnel. Then after our first sheep, we uh, did dissection and we're measuring the fascicle length. And then we confirm if the crystals were placed in the right locations. We then also measured the average fascicle length. And for our next sheep experiment, if the micro stimulation wouldn't work, we would use a needle that we um, poke through the muscle. And then we make the calculation where on average we would have that crystal being placed. So we hope we try to um, optimize the placement in that way. Um, it's not perfect, but we confirm the placement afterwards. And also if the crystals would not be perfectly aligned, even if there is a small error, it would not have a significant effect in our actual length changes. Um, but that's in terms of the first question. The second question is the, so that's a wireless sensor. I think you're referring to right from the ETH group. Um, so this consists of a capacitor, which is has a layer of nanowires. And as this creates a magnetic field, as the capacitor is being stretched, it changes the magnetic field and that we can read out with this wireless readout coil. So there was, a coil connected to the capacitor. Um, the magnetic and, field or the electric field? I'm sorry, an el electric field, sorry. Sorry, the electric field, yes. And um, yes, the electric field. And so the coil, we have another coil that we place on the outside of the body. And so this other coil can then 
read the uh, we can read out with this other call the resonant frequency from the sensor if that makes sense and what do you do with resonance frequency so that we calibrate to tendon strain which is done after the fabrication of uh, the sensor itself um, in a mechanical testing machine so the resonance frequency is associated with the strain yes okay yes thank you thank you john please go ahead yeah a uh, nice clear presentation i enjoyed that uh, so you obviously demonstrated that there's a recoil portion to the tendon uh, after the muscle has has um, is is active. So there's a, a stretching and then a recoil. But if your strains are only one percent, that can't involve much energy, especially if there's hysteresis. And we usually think about that stretch of the tendon and recoil as as a strain energy storage and return uh, system. Uh, but what do you think about this? It's got to be very negligible amounts of energy being re returned. Thank you. Yes, that's that's a very good point and an interesting comment. It's um, it's it's a good comment to debate. So, first of all, we yeah we are looking at um, regional strains um, within the tendon. So if we um, which may be different from the length change of the entire tendon. Um, furthermore, it's the return of energy um, So I'm trying to think how the best way would be to formulate, but we are also we also need to consider that while the sheep is, walking and trotting at certain velocities the sheep can walk at much or can run at much higher velocity so we're not str um, stressing the sheep as much so i would e expect potentially maybe greater length changes i think that another aspect is that maybe it's not necessarily the return of energy of the tendon um, but also these length changes going in line with um, the, the muscle length changes. Um, yeah. yeah, I tend I'm, to agree I'm with that, sure. but that changes your perspective on what the muscle tendon unit is doing as a complex. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, it's definitely, I, I would, yeah. The storage and release of energy, we are looking at these tendons that are the so-called um, uh, tendons that have a more storage and release of energy function, but I think this needs more experiment, like experimental research as well, because it would not be the only function of the tendon, the tendon lengthening, the tendon maybe also, um, lengthening partly to obtain uh, certain muscle lengths during contraction. But yeah, thanks for that. I, I need to think about that a bit more. Thank you. Thanks. Michael, please go ahead. This is good. Sorry if I if I missed this in the presentation, but how do you ensure that the surgery didn't cause any changes to the gait patterns or the muscle tendon unit function in vivo? Thanks, yeah. So we also collected, I didn't talk about that, but we do collect 2D kinematics with a high-speed camera. And so we do record their gates prior to the surgery. So we can compare if there is significant changes in gait. Uh, we did have a summer student who was looking at this um, in specific, but one thing that I definitely also need to do is relate my results to the kinematics uh, and see uh, what that, what that says, says but that we only would have information on the kinematics. So yes, it can be that the uh, technologies impact the muscle tendon unit without altering 
the kinematics, but if those would be significant, we would expect that that would cause significant changes in their gait patterns. Thank you. Thanks. Rob, please go ahead. Hi, Francesca. Thank you for that presentation. It, it uh, fills in some gaps of some of the stuff you've shown me. On the issue that John Bertram was just talking about with the tendon recoil, you know, you're showing a, a tendon stretch and recoil with some hysteresis, and you point to that as the energy loss. I, I, I consistently think that there's a, a misinterpretation in my thought that that's the only energy losses for the system. If you have a, a camel plantaris, there's basically no muscle fibers. It's just tendon between from one bone to the next bone across the joint. And so any stretch of the tendon is, and then recoil is moving the joint because it's just a single elastic element. But in gastrocnemius, you've got muscle fibers in series. The muscle fibers essentially in series with, with tendon. Um, and so if the muscle fibers, after you've reached peak force and you're starting to propel forward, the muscle, if the muscle fibers start to yield at some stage there, which they can do, then the, the recoil of the tendon um, is partly taken up by just yielding of muscle fibers at the end. So I'm not sure that all of what you see in the tendon loop is applied to the joint because some of that's taken up by an elastic piece in series with it, which is the muscle fibers. And so while the picture you show is the classic picture for a tendon stretch and recoil, I'm, I'm not convinced that in, I'm not convinced in any of the studies talking about um, elastic recoil of tendons contributing to energetic changes. And the biggest story that was always put out was about kangaroos having um, these fabulous tendons with, with enormous recoil. That's why they could run fast with no energy, a story that I've never particularly believed. Um, so I, First of all, if I'm saying that if the muscle fibers yield, then you lose some of that tendon energy. Um, uh, perhaps you could comment on that first. I've got a couple of questions. Yeah, I, I think those are some very interesting insights and it's definitely, I agree, much more complex than has always been assumed. Um, you know, we always believe, well, at least how we are taught is that it's, we can think about it as an elastic and the tendon is just stretching and recoiling and returning its energy linearly, but it's clearly not that straightforward. So I think that's a um, really interesting point that you're bringing up about the yielding of the muscle fibers. Um, I am thinking about how we could look at that um but yeah i i don't have an explicit answer i i think it, may, it would be interesting um if, if your muscle fibers were totally isometric throughout the whole event then the energy recoil in the tendon will get applied to the joint but but the muscle fibers aren't isometric and so um uh, you know, some of the stretch of the tendon is occurring due to active energy put in by the muscles. And then some of it's a loss if the muscle fiber yields afterwards. Uh, but if I, if I can move in on from that, you, you show your mechanical testing machine stretching the tendon. And so you, you apply a strain to the tendon. Did you at the same time put your crystals on and your other measurement techniques on to confirm that the length changes that you impose with the testing machine where you 
absolutely know your, your forces and your length changes to verify that your um, gauges were doing exactly the same measurement. And, and I ask that because ultrasound velocity, as we've discussed, ultrasound velocity depends on the, um, uh, the stiffness of the tissue and in tendon, I thought the, um, you know, there's, there's some literature showing that the speed of sound in tendon is variable with the, the stress. And so I'm wondering if you use that mechanical testing machine to verify your other senses. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for bringing that up. So we did always try to get um, the data that we could during the in vitro from the buckle or the crystals. Um, however, um, as um, I've been doing prior to the in, in vivo experiments, in vitro experiments as well with the crystals in the tendon, um, we've experienced that it's extremely hard to get good um, results from crystals in tendon and particularly in vitro because it's the, we need so much. So we add ultrasound gel around the tendon and the crystals. And in fact, we only had one from all the trials that were done from the in vitro experiments, the pilot test, we only had one where we could actually show very nice um, tendon data from the crystal. So crystal displacement data in the tendon where uh, we had really good data. Now, we did do some experiments where we tested um, if the speed of sound is changing when we are stretching the tendon, because it's like, as you're saying, there are studies that indeed show there is a change in speed of sound as the tendon is contracting. So we were looking at that. We did see that there is a change in the uh, wave form of the speed of sound, but when we then, tested it again in the tenon explicitly. And when we do have a good measurement where the crystals are really embedded in a portion of the tendon that is, um, for example, the portion close to the calcaneus is more round and thicker. If we have the crystals in there, we get nice data. We actually do see, uh, we haven't validated this with the MTS machine. Um, because it has been so complicated, but manually we've been measuring the length and we indeed see that with the sonar micrometry, we get, for example, length changes of one millimeter, which is what we are inducing. So if there is an effect, the effect um, of this change in stiffness would not be big enough to actually show us to impact our strain results. The problem is just to get good uh, data from the crystals in the tendon. So that's why we then move to having the crystals outside of the tendon, because then we don't have this issue. And this is in our last sheep where we actually got really nice data in vivo. We then try to get the crystal data from that uh, crystals outside in vitro, which didn't work, because likely related to the ultrasound gel that was moving around um, and then the ultrasound gel was continuously dropping off. So unfortunately, we have not been able to actually validate um, all of this and particularly validate it when we have exactly the same tendon that we took from our in vivo. But we did do pilot tests prior to the experiments with the buckle. Um, I mean, the buckle has been used uh, in, in a lot of, ex a lot of like, for several, for a long time. Um, and we did also test the wireless sensor from Switzerland, where we look at regional strains versus the length changes that we induce with the MTS machine. And then, um, I mean, I could show you some of those results. We do see similar curves, um, but yeah, long story short, um, not exactly have we been able, but we're trying, <laughs> yeah. And I, I'm not sure what I'm saying here. Um, you talk about the aponeurosis, uh, um, the tendon and the aponeurosis not being in series. And I just get a little bit lost here because if you go along the, particularly in gastroc, where medial gastroc, where it's very simple and very easy to see this, 
when you get a fascicle coming up to the surface, the aponeurosis, rather than describing it as a sheet, I would describe it as a series of individual collagen strands. And that muscle fascicle will uh, insert into a, a single strand. And you can actually track that strand, or at least you can on a cat gastro, you can track that strand as it continues down across the aponeurosis and even track it into the tendon a bit. So it is actually the, the tendon down near the calcaneus, as you describe, is, is a circular lump and it's, but the strands run and then turns into a bit of a, a sheet of um, uh, individual ropes or individual strands that then go to the, the muscle fascicles and, and a sequence of muscle fascicles will insert onto that strand. So in that sense, I see the muscle fascicle in series with a strand of collagen that contributes to the tendon. I, I see the argument that you've got a three-dimensional structure of the muscle and therefore that can alter what happens there. But in fact, that collagen strand is continuous from the end of the muscle fascicle all the way down to the calcaneus. And you basically have then a whole series of, of strands that then, as you get close to the calcaneus, combine through cross bridges to make a, a solid lump. So I just, I, I appreciate the argument that the muscular region of aponeurosis has three dimensional shapes and things. But in fact, Distinguishing the aponeurosis as a separate entity to the tendon, I have difficulty because it's continuous. Well, you, yeah, I mean, yeah, so from, from an anatomical point of view, um, that's true. So it's indeed in series with the muscle. But the thing is that when we have, when you're talking about this one aponeurosis fiber that is material, there are several muscle fascicles that are inserting in there. So it's not only that one. So it's parts of the muscle that are connected to parts of the aponeurosis. And as the muscle is contracting, this will impact the aponeurosis. It's the force does not, not all the force goes through the aponeurosis. So if we have the tendon that's external to the muscle, it's clear that all those forces go through the tendon to the bone. But in terms of the aponeurosis, there is, um, I would, it's um, from a mechanical point, it's, it's um, impacted by the changes of the muscle. So you would not be able to assume that the aponeurosis endures the same forces. And if that would be the case, then we, how would you explain that if you um, plot aponeurosis strain versus forces, you get a positive, uh, a counter, sorry, a counterclockwise loop. So there's energy being produced as well as the other studies that have shown that I've actually made the assumption and then even assume that the mechanical properties of the aponeurosis change. So there is um, a, a, a review of, of Walter that clearly goes through um, a lot of the of the reasoning also behind this, but um, I mean, I do see your point of the ana anatomical perspective, but from a mechanical point of view, it doesn't make sense. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Is it's that, complex. It, I appreciate. It, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Thank you, Francis. Thank you, Ro. Walter, please go ahead. Yeah, just, just a couple of follow-up comments to uh, to Rob's, and maybe just start with the, the latter one. The the problem is that uh, when a unipenny muscle like the cat medial gastric nemus and any other muscle actually uh, is contracting, um, there's a pressure buildup and there's a shear force buildup, 
And that's the reason why the fascicle, the angle of penation in the unipenate muscle get bigger. And that needs to be accounted for as part of the force that's actually produced by the muscle. And therefore, the force that you measure at the tendon is uh, greater and then at any part in the aponeurosis. In fact, when you model that, you can see very nicely that uh, towards the end of the aponeurosis, the force actually becomes zero. So then the problem is if you now measure length changes in your aponeurosis, where the forces are significantly smaller and variable depending on the contractile condition because the shear force and the pressure changes, uh, then and you relate that to the force that you measure at the tendon, then you assume when you then calculate, let's say, stiffness like Magnuson did or elastic energy recoil like uh, Lutzen, uh, um, Tom Roberts did in his beautiful science paper, then you completely overestimate what that force is and the energy that's produced. And that's the problem because it's not only the fascicle that produces force, but it's the shear forces and the, and, and the pressure that builds up in a muscle. And therefore, uh, you know, and therefore it's a, it, you know, you, 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 you cannot just take a point and, and solve a static equilibrium situation, but that has been done. And that's, Old, 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 old news. <laughs> uh, you know, in 1984, uh, Renaud Vatier wrote a beautiful, beautiful paper where this is perfectly explained. And then in about 1988 or 1989, Ekber Ottner wrote a beautiful, beautiful paper in Exercise and Sports Sciences U where, where the math mathematics of this is beautifully outlined. Uh, but th there is this discrepancy between, you know, the, the engineering people that look at that and the ex experimental biologists and the physiologists that, that, you know, just neglect all these other things that are happening in the muscle and therefore arrive at the wrong conclusions, uh, you know, in, including beautiful Tom Roberts science, uh, science paper, which is a beautiful, beautiful paper in all aspects, except that the mechanics and the conclusions are wrong. But uh, the other point that I wanted to get at is, uh, I always like to talk about that is, is the storage and release of elastic energy in the tendon. And the head would, would actually agree with you, uh, Rob, that, that that's, at, at least as far as I'm concerned, an unresolved issue because the, the common argument has always been that, uh, oh, you know, when, when you have that tendon elongation, then you prevent the fascicles from shortening. And since shortening requires more energy, uh, you know, then, then the tendon saves you energy and the muscle doesn't have to expend as much energy. What people always tend to forget uh, is that, uh, you know, the muscle is also stretched, you know, usually in a, in a, in a you know, in a middle gastrocnemius muscle, for example, in that preparation, the muscle is elongating and then it's shortening. And that, that elongation, of course, uh, eccentric contraction would require much less energy and the shortening contraction would require much more energy. And then the balance of it, it's not really quite clear. And, you know, recent experiments by Tom Roberts and, re and, and some experiments uh, by also by Doug Syme here in Calgary seem to suggest when you eliminate the tendon and you do all the elongation and shortening and all the work with the muscle fascicles, then it seems to be energetically about similar as when you have the tendon that's taking up and, and, and releasing the energy. And so, um, but, but I must say, neither Tom Roberts nor Doc Symes' experiment are actually really perfectly done. And I've been thinking for a long time how you could make those experiments really very clever and, and, and very good and, and absolutely convincing. But, uh, but my hunch is that they are, in general, correct, uh, Doug and, and Tom, that, that the tendon uh, compliance doesn't really, uh, in the stretch shortening cycle, really doesn't save you energy but it's probably there for 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 other reasons <clears throat> yeah john please go ahead so i was just going to comment on something walter said so uh there are certain circumstances with uh, animals that are known to be uh, good runners like horses where some of the um uh, important muscles have tendons that are well over 10 centimeters in length, but highly pennate 
uh, fiber uh, muscles that have fibers less than around five or six millimeters. And so there's no way that that muscle can actually do work across the joint. Um, but the load is actually I think we lost your audio, John. NVIDIA dropout. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. Okay. So it didn't slip into mute. I just, uh, I just uh, had a bit of dropout. So those, if those muscle fibers are stretched as Walter had suggested, then they'll go into their eccentric um, uh, force velocity curve and can probably apply twice as much force for the same amount of energy. And if force is what they're there for, rather than doing work, uh, that's not a bad way to put the system together. Can I briefly respond to that? Yeah, that's, it. That, that, that's a very interesting point. And, you know, and, uh, and I think uh, Alan Wilson there has, a, has that beautiful study on tendons that are actually, I think, even longer, you know, like 50 or 60 centimeters, and, 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 and the fascicles are very, very short. And the argument that they make there is that they think that the remnant muscle that's still there is kind of controlling, uh, controlling the system stiffness, you know, because the, the muscle and the tendon are in, in series. And then if you increase the stiffness of one, then the whole system stiffness is, is kind of changed. And, um, so, so they make, make the argument almost that the muscle is not really doing much exactly as you say, because the fascicles are so short and there's not much work, negative or positive that can be produced, but that the muscle almost works as a, as a stiffness regulator. I thought that was an interesting idea, but you know, I'm not familiar with those type of very specialized muscles. So. Are there any final questions for Siska? Okay, if there are no final questions, please join me in again thanking Siska for her wonderful presentation today. And thank you to all the audience members for their questions. Um, as a reminder, this is the final HPL seminar of the year and I hope everyone has a happy holiday and I'll see everyone again at the seminars in the new year.